This is Edward Jenner, and I'm Richard Kramer. And we're going to talk about some chemistry that's about 25 years old now. It was done back around 1962. Um, the reason it was brought up was that I had a, a letter from Bert Davis. He's a professor of chemistry down at the University of Kentucky. and. Uh, he conceived the idea of collecting reports, uh, describing the work uh, involved in uh, significant advances in, in coordination chemistry. Um, what this, uh, this material was concerned with was, uh, on our parts, was the uh, a mechanism for the uh, dimerization of ethylene to butene. Um, it was considered uh, to be the first example uh, of a study of homogeneous catalysis uh, by a transition metal that was uh, done with enough uh, support to be considered an established mechanism. You, you probably uh, made the comment or heard it made that timing is everything and uh, certainly this uh, work was done at, at a time. Time was right for, for making the study. Um, the chemistry had developed to just about the ideal state. Um, even uh, it, uh, organic or coordination chemistry that was not uh, concerned uh, with organometallic chemistry at all had reached uh, a state where it was uh, maybe taken over much of the theoretical study in inorganic chemistry. Um, a case in point, the um, inorganic section of uh, the American Chemical Society held a meeting in 1964 to, uh, to uh, discuss the mechanism of inorganic reactions. And uh, of the nine papers that were presented and discussed in that meeting, uh, uh, all but one were concerned with, with coordination chemistry, uh, strictly inorganic compounds. Um, there was a, a tremendous interest in, in chemistry created by the discovery of ferrocene. Uh, there was a lot of debate about the nature of the bond that held cyclopentadiene to, uh, to iron. A lot more compounds prepared that were cyclopentadienyl derivatives. And the speculation about the structure of the compound and the uh, explanation of the way it was attached, the, the, the ligands were attached to uh, iron, led to fresh speculation about other combinations of uh, groups of carbon atoms that, that might behave this, the similar fashion uh, in sort of unorthodox bonding. And that uh, led to attempts to synthesize those compounds. Which, there were just a tremendous number of new compounds being formed. Um, there were new syntheses being being written, and uh, of course you were you were involved in those. Uh, a group group of du uh, Dupont people uh, studied a number of reactions. Uh, a few of them are are listed on this on on this chart. And they include reactions in in which uh, ethylene is dimerized to give one butene. It also reacts with butadiene to give 
1,4-hexadiene. Um, an interesting feature of this, this work in, uh, in homogeneous catalysis was the specificity of the uh, reactions. I think, well, as, as you well recall, uh, in this reaction, uh, you got one butene, you didn't get any higher products. You, the reaction stopped after you got... All those reactions are very clean, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, here, there was no... Although, you, although in this system, if butadiene were not there, you would have got butenes. In the presence of butadiene, there was no dimer of ethylene formed. It was the 1,4 the, uh, hexadiene that was the product. There was no simple butadiene dimer, no ethylene dimer, but the, that mixed product, that was its whole product. And as you said, the rest of these reactions, a platinum tin catalyzed, uh, car carbonylation or carboxymethylation of ethylene uh, and reductions of both the olefin bond and, and the carbonyl group. Uh, and these, these were uh, exciting reactions. They were, the, they were and there, was, there were more reactions studied in other companies um, more reactions, in fact, studying within DuPont, uh, the knees that are listed. But uh, they give you some example uh, of, of what, what could be done. Um, now, in addition to that, in, in, in addition to the new structures and the syntheses, um, there, there were other things that, it, that indicated the, that indicate now the, the activity that was being generated at that time. I, I think two of our journals in organic metallic chemistry were founded about, about mm -hmm. coincidental with this. Uh, you can get some idea of DuPont's interest in, uh, in this chemistry by the fact that uh, two chemists uh, left the company on sabbaticals temporarily to study uh, the organometallic chemistry at, at the universities and under and, and with professors who were uh, authorities in the field. Just, well, that was George Parshall. Yes, George Parshall and Dick Lindsay went right, up to right. MIT. Mm -hmm. um, it, it it was a a, a field that was. was Red hot with interest, and, and also new tools were developed that made it an appropriate, a real good time to be getting into it. I think especially uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. It, it, without nuclear magnetic resonance, it would not have been possible to uh, establish such a convincing proof of some of. The, as we have some of the intermediates that occur in the in the uh, reaction cycle, um, I um, uh, was fortunate in in being able. I had just completed a a, a study. Uh, uh, of sulfur fluorine chemistry and uh, became available to, to consider a new project. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, happy to be offered a chance to work on this. I, there was some feeling in the department that a, a mechanism should be studied on, on some, uh, or some uh, uh, system in which the catalyst was a solution of uh, transition metal of the sort that uh, had been used in your work or other transition metal. A homogeneous uh, system like this is particularly amenable to theoretical study because you don't have the surfaces to contend with. That's right. And, and also there was the aspect that uh, uh, something that one could learn uh, from behavior of an organic compound in a solution could be translated to the surfaces of 
of a heterogeneous ca catalyst and the, the interaction there would, would be worthwhile. Um, I think, uh, at least so far as I can recall, uh, you were the uh, uh, first, the author of, uh, or you wrote a memo, the first that I've seen and, and I had seen on the subject, suggesting that, uh, that we in, in DuPont undertake such a study. I, I think it was something that uh, other, other people talked about and may have, may have suggested, but it's your suggestion that I first saw. And when I left this uh, sulfur uh, fluoride chemistry, uh, it was available to work on, uh, and, and I was, was happy to have a chance to do it. I didn't have much of a background for to, to work on coordination chemistry, but, but the only thing I can think of is uh, when I was an undergraduate, uh, one of my teachers was uh, interested in doing some uh, activity coefficient studies on cobalt amines, and he had me make some of these uh, for, his, uh, for his studies. This was at Juniata College? Yeah, back at Juniata. Sort of a nice piece of work for a small college like that. His work, yes. yes. He, had, he, had, he had studied in Denmark. He finally got his degree in, in uh, Denmark. And uh, this uh, was a problem that he carried back mm -hmm. then. It was, it was, it was un rather unusual for the college I went to for a professor to be doing research. But anyway, the only thing I can recall now carrying away from this experience was an acquaintance with Werner's book. I don't know whether you've ever read his book. I know of it. I've not, not read it. it. Well, chemists are apt to say things like this, but everybody, at least every chemist, I think, should read it. it uh, it's, it's a classic, is, there's no, no doubt about that. Well, uh, that book and, uh, and uh, his view of, uh, of bonding uh, uh, which went beyond the familiar bonding of that time, like uh, substantial chemis chemical bonds being formed by reaction of charged ions and combination of charged ions. This went a stage beyond it and got to the region of uh, shared electron pairs and uh, donors of electron that came in with Lewis theory, but it was, it was decades before that, th that theory. Uh, that way of formulating valence. So that's, that's one point. And the other point was the discovery that uh, it's sometimes a lot more difficult to uh, repeat experiments, syntheses that are described in the literature than it is to do what's in a laboratory notebook. Sometimes you just can't do what it says there is in the Very literature. Very true. Um, so I learned that early before I went to graduate school. Um, but um, I was uh, I was it's a little strong you put it this way but I, I was in fact in, inspired by the, the timeliness of the problem and the interest of it the excitement of it to do a great deal more work uh, uh, learning about it. And I had in, uh, generally in the 20 years that I'd spent in, with DuPont doing research before this time. They had, there had been good problems then, but nothing that quite uh, excited me as much as this did. Um, I studied the uh, literature generally, but I think uh, some of the most interesting papers and the, the most significant as far as so far as education were concerned were 
a series of papers that were put out by uh, Joseph Chat and and some of his co-workers uh, working in England. I I don't know I don't recall now whom Chat was associated when he did this work, which was published. It looks as though it's broad enough to have been a university association. Yet I know that he was on hand, that he was involved with some governmental work trying to uh, fix nitrogen uh, in a low energy catalytic problems like the microbes can, but using catalytic. But the subjects, some of the subjects that he uh, talked about, and these are uh, more theoretical problems than any attempt to accomplish a synthesis, uh, were a classification of the metal and ligand interactions in the terms of uh, hard and soft bases, or which is, as you well know and have preached to me about, uh, the uh, uh, significance of polarization or, or pi bonding in establishing the strength of, uh, 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 of chemical bonds. Yeah, some, between compounds. some of the ions are much more deformable than others and get increasingly covalent character in their bonds. And now this was, uh, uh, that, that was the burden of these papers that he made with Davies as, as concerned with coordination chemistry. And he had a series of, of papers with Wilkins that, that characterized uh, cis and trans complexes of platinum um, you know the the form the the form of the of the four coordinate platinum divalent platinum complex can be described as a plane Surely. with uh, with ligands at the corner of that plane and and platinum sitting in the middle and uh, it turns out that in the reaction. Of, uh, of, a, uh, of, of a of one ligand, um, the one which is diagonally across the ring has more effect on the reactivity of the first ligand we're talking about than those that are adjacent to it. Sort of a trans effect. Yes, mm -hmm. the trans effect is the name that, that has, was given, mm -hmm. has been given to it. And uh, he, uh, he went into quite an intensive study of the, uh, of the character, uh, characterization of the trans effect, uh, of the uh, isomerization, which changed from a, a compound which has trans ligands to those that had divisional ligands. And he also did some wor work on the uh, uh, kinetic explanation of uh, how this came about. Mm -hmm. He also, with uh, Duncanson and Shaw and Venanzi, uh, made uh, uh, platinum hydrides, and as, uh, as you're aware, and as, uh, as was discovered in, in the work that I did, uh, the formation of hydrides is uh, uh, is an important aspect in the in the synthetic chemistry of uh, in metal catalyzed reactions. And finally, this paper with Duncanson that was a description of the bond that uh, was formed between uh, platinum and ethylene in coordination compounds of ethylene was was uh, quite significant. Uh, it was explained in terms of a sort of a double bond where the platinum in one case acting uh, as an acid uh, took electrons from the double bond of the ethylene and then formed a bond from platinum to the middle of the ethylene molecule mm -hmm. and a second bond was formed from 
platinum with electrons donated by ethylene, the terminal carbons of ethylene, let's say, to form a second bond. Um, this had uh, been uh, brushed on by Dewar earlier. Uh, the explanation had been touched upon as part of a, uh, a group of pi bonding compounds, uh, 20 or so, but uh, Duncanson and, and uh, Chap fleshed this out so that uh, it, it uh, seemed a lot more real than the rather perfunctory treatment that Dewar had given. Now, was most of this work done in the late 50s or about when? Uh, that's, that's right. It, it started uh, in, in the early 50s. It, it was finished by the time that I was getting educated, which was about 1960 or, or so. Mm -hmm. So th this was, and it is a, a small part of the fer ferment that, that was going on in, yes. in, in this area of chemistry. But uh, one uh, part that, that particularly interested me, but it, it, in a sense, it gives you some picture of the activity, uh, the, the way thinking was going in uh, this chemistry at that time. I, I met Professor Chat, or do, uh, Dr. Chat, I should probably say, uh, a couple of times uh, after, after uh, the work that I did on the dimerization was published. Uh, he is he is an extremely fine gentleman. He he's a uh, uh, what is the doctor who uh, uh, the professor who uh, chips d chips is Doctor Chips sort of man. Um, Quite different from the from some of the younger uh, abrasive young men that you saw <laughs> in the field of coordination chemistry. As a as a semi old man, I uh, I could emphasize very much with with chat. So um, I I was I was into. Um, the background to to, to under to undertake thorough working in the problem as I was beginning to get my feet wet. In this connection, it might be a, a good idea for me to to uh, get your assent about the broad spectrum of properties of rhodium uh, in its chemistry. Um, I think mean, rhodium compounds, most rhodium compounds, practically all were regarded to have a valence of one or a valence of three. And the valence one rhodium compounds are four coordinate structure, that is this square planar structure that we've talked, we talked, mentioned. Uh, and they had four, four ligands. They are generally yellow colored. Uh, and it was the less common form of rhodium uh, at that time, but still is. The usual form of, of rhodium is valence 3. It is six coordinate or octahedral in its form and uh, red colored, as it should be to give it a name to the element. After all, that red color is what. Most of the rhodium compounds I'd seen were red, so that's yeah, it. and it, it fits the color. Uh, this change in valence is an important part of the uh, of the mechanism of ethylene in the mechanism of dimerization of ethylene, um, and uh, I'd like to uh, show you how this comes about in uh, the, in the uh, in the butadiene reaction. We have our 
for uh, four coordinate uh, uh, rhodium complex that has four ligands on it. It reacts with a hydrogen halide uh, to give us a five, uh, six coordinate compound, rather. We have, say, L4 for the other ligands that are on it, rhodium, a chloride from the HCl, and a hydrogen. The hydrogen, in manner speaking, has robbed rhodium of a, of a couple of electrons in coming, in, in, in reacting with it. It's become a hydride. Started out here as a proton. It's become a hydride. And in consequence, the rhodium has gone from rhodium-1 to rhodium-3. Uh, that change in, uh, that change in valence uh, and that introduction of hydrogen it, uh, as, as uh, a ligand on rhodium is, uh, is really the core of the hexadiene synthesis, the core reaction in the hexadiene synthesis. Well, make it one of the cores, two cores. But, you know. uh, The um, uh, this this description of hydrogen is going from a proton to a hydride. Um, I don't know how, how accurately putting those names to it, it uh, is in terms of the of the actual protons uh, or electrons around hydrogen, but uh, it, it serves as a, as a reasonable expo explanation in the turn to valence. It fits, Cer fits with the rhodium changing color and it changing its coordination also. Correctly. It fits with both those things. Um, now, when, as, as, you, as you know well, when you were working with this uh, reaction, it was customary to run the various reactions that we talked about in the first chart in autoclaves at, at relatively high pressures of ethylene in the order of several hundred atmospheres. Ethylene Very high pressure. Uh, temperatures around 50, 60 degrees. Uh, temperature may have been different for the tin reaction, I don't recall. But generally, moderately severe conditions as far as the pressure was concerned. And uh, when uh, very soon after I got into the uh, study of the chemistry, I learned reaction could be run very conveniently at atmospheric pressure with ethylene. And, uh, nice, much nicer for study mechanism. You work oh, in atmospheric pressure. You could pressure. work in glass and see what was going on inside mm -hmm. there, and uh, uh, it also slowed down the rate enough so that uh, so you, it was convenient in time to to watch the changes that occurred. <coughs> I started in trying trying my teeth on the ethylene butadiene reaction because there was some interest in that commercially, but found after a few months that it was uh, really a little complex and maybe I'd simplify things by going back to the ethylene uh, uh, dimerization reaction. And the first thing that I, f that I found, I guess going to those milder conditions, was that uh, uh, there was an induction period using rhodium trichloride, which was the, the form that rhodium was introduced into the reaction mixture, using that uh, as the catalyst. It, uh, at uh, atmospheric pressure and uh, at uh, temperatures of the order, room temperature, 30 degrees centigrade, 
uh, that uh, induction period lasted for oh, 20, 30 minutes. And then dimerization occurred. <coughs> um, rhodium trichloride, incidentally, is uh, you, you really ought to put exclamation marks or, or not. Or you ought to mark it some way as being not quite real because rhodium chloride is really a glass. It's uh, <coughs> the material that we got, if you had it in analyzed, you found that uh, it contained uh, about 3.2 chloride ions for each rhodium. Yes, I, rec I recall and, this in my own work, and, too. And yeah. about uh, a little over two molecules of water mm -hmm. associated with it. Um, but uh, it was the rhodium material available to start. Uh, in these early experiments, uh, we found that uh, there was a, a, an orange-colored solid separated in a good many of the reaction mixtures. <coughs> and uh, um, it, it, it seemed like that it might possibly be closer to the catalyst. So uh, uh, we made a larger supply of it by putting a massive amount of rhodium into a flask and mm -hmm. treating it with ethylene and, and got material to study. Now, the, uh, it turned out that this uh, orange-colored material was a rhodium complex that had contained ethylene. <coughs> the reaction also gave it uh, acid aldehyde, and apparently the ro rhodium was reduced to a, a monovalent compound by... Uh, oxidation of ethylene to acid aldehyde. Uh, there was an analogous compound of carbon monoxide that was known. It had the structure that's shown here, except that there were carbon monoxide ligands for uh, on here instead of instead of uh, ethylene ligands. And it was a more soluble compound. It had been recrystallized, and its crystal structure determined to uh, have to consist of a, a planar molecule that was bent where the where the chloride where the chlorides are in it, like uh, so, like this, bent up to have a structure such as that. A butterfly molecule. A butterfly molecule. And uh, uh, the, um, the, um, the angle between there was about 124 degrees between these two faces. Um, now our compound was, our ethylene compound, was not soluble enough to recrystallize <coughs> it, it, it was brick-like. It decomposed when you heated it to 115. We did succeed in preparing some uh, fairly good crystals by just running this reaction slowly, low concentration of ethylene. And so we got material that we could get a fair look at and by crystallography. And it turned out that... Uh, uh, you could determine what the unit cell was in the material we got. It uh, it looked as though the, it had the same geometry as the carbon monoxide complex, and this material had uh, the, the unit cell had uh, eight uh, had four eight formula weights that is uh, of eight units of. <coughs> of half of the molecule, or, or four of these molecules pictured like that. Now, uh, as I said, this compound, this rhodia, diethylene rhodium chloride, is not 
soluble, it couldn't be recrystallized, but it will dissolve in uh, dilute um, in alcohol that contains a little hydrogen chloride in it. Well, it's, uh, say half more in hydrogen chloride. It dissolves about as fast as sugar dissolves in water. It goes right into solution in that. And when it does, it catalyzes dimerization of ethylene right away. Now, apparently we got, got close to, the, or maybe into the catalyst system that is effective for the dimerization. And we could start our studies using this material as our source of rhodium and uh, not be concerned with any time that it took to get it, to get into a react into a, an active reaction system. <clears throat> but in addition, we had two other compounds available to use, which were equally effective as catalysts and immediately effective without any preamble. Uh, one of those was an acetyl acetonate complex. That would be a compound in which the chlorides here are replaced with an acetyl acetone, that is a, a bidentate ligand. And uh, that material is yellow, it's, it's readily soluble, and so it is convenient in a lot of sources where you want to study <coughs> the reaction uh, of the rhodium complex in solution, uh, a monovalent rhodium complex in solution, uh, in, in, a, in a form where you can just study the properties of that solution, or you can make up reaction mixtures ahead of time using a dissolved uh, catalyst rather than the the, rather than the solid catalyst. Now, so, are these things all yellow? Well, this the solid of this dimer. Let, let, let's call it the uh, ethylene rhodium chloride dimer. Is a, an orange color. It's not. It's not deep red, but mm -hmm. it. But it looks like it has a little bit of the red in it, and, mm -hmm. and maybe that's because. Uh, in, in the solid form, there may be uh, association with other chlorides that's close enough to affect the electron cloud to, to bend the energy levels enough so it has a little red color. I don't know. It certainly is not the red. It, 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 if you want to see it that way, it looks like a rhodium-1 compound. Mm -hmm. The... Uh, Acetyl acetonate complex is definitely yellow. The third compound is a cyclopentadienyl rhodium diethylene compound. Uh, that was prepared by Bruce King. He came to uh, DuPont, I think, in the explosives department. Uh, he just just fresh from graduate school, where he had been making a lot of cyclopentadienyl compounds. And when, we, when he saw that we had this material, he said, well, the thing to do is replace one of those chlorides with a cyclopentadienyl group. And uh, he made that compound and turned it over to us after he succeeded in synthesizing it. Now, that compound will turn out, it is catalytic. It is a catalyst. It'll turn out to have a lot of other um, properties that... Uh, may uh, give you a lot of insight into rhodium uh, coordination chemistry that, that uh, I want to talk about uh, worthwhile things to talk about in, in connection with the dimerization, although it doesn't deal di directly with it. At any rate, we had those three compounds that we could use uh, that were active immediately and could be considered to be uh, part of the catalyst system or, or give it to us real quickly. Um, 
I think now I'm, uh, I'm ready to put, put the mechanism in front of you. I, I think I'd, I'd rather do that by presenting the, the whole mechanism as a piece and then go back and discuss the evidence for each of the reactions that we know and, and the evidence for the individual steps in the reaction. Um, if I tried to describe the proofs and the evidence and the details of all these things, um, it would, and then deduce the mechanism from those, it would get to be a tortured, uh, at least a more tortured thing than it is going at it this way. This in doing that, the, there, there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of work done that might not have been immediately necessary, but I had very much in mind uh, 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 the work of uh, uh, a German chemist that had, had been Kistikowski's teacher. What deuce was his name? Was this Bodenstein? Right, right, Bodenstein. Um, Bodenstein had made some some very fine, uh, done some very fine mechanism studies in inorganic chemistry. And uh, when I was working with Kistiakowski, he virtually insisted that I read these papers and study them, even though uh, my work with him was in no way connected with kinetics or mechanism, but just as a matter of education. And I, I I must say they were right. I, uh, there, there couldn't have been much more thorough job of, of studying the mechanism of reaction. He, uh, he not, for he, he tried to find all of the intermediates in the in his proposed mechanism. He. Uh, he studied the intermediates for what they might be have expect be expected to do in the reaction mixture and and uh, come to some conclusion about why they didn't do it uh, it, it was just a thorough study and as i say i I had this work very much in mind when I was working at it and uh, uh, wanted wanted to find a place for everything that means that there's a lot of detail that that uh, that substantiates the mechanism well if you'll accept the presentation of the mechanism in that way i'll give you a chart that shows the reaction steps that are involved now in this chart all the monovalent rhodium things are have the rhodium written in green and all the trivalent rhodium compounds are in red. Uh, the rhodium is marked in red. Um, the compounds are indicated by in blue here uh, to give them a name or an indicator. And the reactions are numbered. Um, we sh a good place to start is assuming that we use the acetyl acetonate ethylene rhodium complex is a starting place. That's the here. And when you add hydrochloric acid to that, the first step is to give us this bridged compound that we talked about before, the diethylene rhodium chloride dimer. Um, that I've described as being insoluble. It has a very slight solubility, but if you, your con solutions are a little concentrated, it precipitates, and you can see that you've got that, you get that compound from adding HCl to it. The next step is the formation of a, adding more HCl, is the formation of a complex which has two ethylenes uh, and two chlorides attached to the rhodium. It is, has, uh, it is an anion. Uh, a monovalent anion, um, as we propose here. Still, still uh, 
rhodium-1. The next step is the oxidation of rhodium step. That is, the place where we add hydrogen halide, the hydrogen comes in as a hydride and pulls a couple of electrons away from rhodium, making it trivalent rhodium. Um, the next step is a sort of um, primordial insertion reaction in which an ethylene is inserted, uh, in, in which a hydrogen is inserted between uh, one of the ethylene ligands to give us an ethyl group in this compound. So we have an ethyl group attached to rhodium and also one of the ethylenes that had been there originally. Another chloride comes in and to finish up the bookkeeping on the coordination of the rhodium, we've put in a solvent molecule. Now that's not doing violence to, uh, uh, to what can happen in, in coordination chemistry because a, a lot of coordination chemists have spent a lot of time and effort in studying uh, solvation reactions where uh, a, an anion that's attached to rhodium or to any other metal is displaced by a molecule of the solvent, alcohol or water or whatnot. And, and so it would be entirely with entirely regulation for a, a, solv a, a solvent molecule to be included. The next step in the reaction is the insertion of the ethylene, which the second ethylene, which is attached to it, between the ethyl group, which has just been formed, to give you a normal butyl group attached to, uh, attached to uh, rhodium. Uh, we've not added any chloride here, so I've still got the same number of three chlorine ligands, ligands but we put two solvent molecules just to, just to maintain six coordination. Now, the next step that they propose is the reduction of rhodium through the loss of hydrogen as a proton, that is, as HCl is, is, is removed, one of the chlorides come along with it, of course, is HCl, and that, that hydrogen comes from the one butene, which is coordinated here, and gives us I uh, should from the from the butyl group, which is coordinated here, and gives us one butene coordinated to uh, rhodium, al along with the other ligands we've talked about. But now rhodium one. Uh, next follows the replacement of the solvent molecule uh, by ethylene, uh, and finally the displacement of one butene by a second ethylene, which brings us back to this compound, C. And so the synthesis, uh, the, the dimerization of ethylene, follows this reaction cycle repeated over and over and over for each molecule of uh, uh, of butene that's produced, uh, rhodium-1 is oxidized to rhodium-3, uh, re is reduced to rhodium-1, and we have this series of insertion reactions here and the release of, of, of butene in the final step of the synthesis. Now, is one of those a slow reaction, so it's rate determining, or...? Yes. Uh, it, and that's indicated in the the red in this red numeral here. Uh, underneath, for example, the, this reaction and a number of reactions. In fact, all of them I marked as reactions that can occur readily at minus 35 degrees. If you have uh, some uh, the, these. 
some of the reactions can be isolated and shown to occur at minus 35 degrees, and uh, and other of them can be shown in reaction systems to occur at minus 35. So it's possible for all of them to occur at minus 35. But this step, the insertion of ethylene between rhodium and the ethyl group, uh, will not occur at minus 10 degrees. It is, in fact, very slow at plus 10 degrees. That's, that's not a useful temperature for trying to make butene at all. And so because of that temperature difference, it looks like this is the slowest reaction at, under normal conditions uh, of, all, of all the steps that are involved here. That is a slow reaction. That is the rate determining step in the, in the rate by which ethylene is dimerized to butene. Um, and uh, it, 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 it should be, be, hopefully it would be possible to uh, isolate this and, and prove that it's transformation to, from E to F uh, was consistent with what we've just in, inferred from a comparison of the temperatures of the reaction. Um, I'd like now to start at the beginning and, and describe the evidence for the steps that we write in here and for the reality of the species that are in it. Of course, we know the acetyl acetonate complex. We have that out. And we know that when we treat it with a, a mole of, uh, of HCl, we do get this uh, one mole of HCl for acetyl. We can get this compound. Um, but now a question comes up. Uh, we were never ever able to isolate this compound, the uh, diethylene rhodium dichloride, complex C, when it cannot be precipitated by uh, any cation that we tried. Uh, when you tried to concentrate solutions uh, to insist that it precipitate out as a salt, it either reverted to back to B complex, which precipitated out, or it underwent self-oxidation reduction and gave you some sort of rhodium-3 compound and, and precipitated metallic rhodium in, uh, in the reaction flask. And yet, we wanted to get some evidence of the reality of that species, and we sought to do it by means of spectrophotometry and, uh, and by titration, by following the way the concentration of chloride ion in the reaction mixture was affected as we added more hydrochloric acid to, uh, to the acetyl astronate. And we did get evidence of that through the formation of isosbestic points in a titration of, of the acetyl astronate with hydrogen chloride. Now, uh, I guess in order to make that convincing, I ought to uh, say what an isosbestic point is and how it works. Um, we can... assume that the acetyl acetonate complex and this uh, ethylene chloride dimer uh, will have uh, different spectra. It's true that the dimer will be very 
is sparingly soluble, but you can get solutions concentrated enough so that you can get a spectrum of it. And let's assume that we do make uh, a solution of uh, the acetyl astronate, and we get its spectrum, which might be, oh, something like this. Um, where you go along the way, the, the, the absorptivity of the solution uh, would be the y-axis of this drawing, and, and the uh, wavelength is along the x-axis. And assume that uh, this diethylene rhodium chloride dimer also uh, has a spectrum which uh, is certainly not identical with this, but it looks uh, something, uh, well, well, to define an isobestic, I can write something like this. Now you notice that there is one point here where the, they have the this solutions of the same strength have the same absorptivity. And so if we add hydrogen chloride to our acetyl acetonate complex and some of it changes to the bridge complex, the absorptivity and nothing else, the absorptivity at this point will not change. It'll stay fixed at that, at that place. And uh, of course, if some other material is formed, which has another different spectrum, then the ro part of the rhodium will be used up that was in these species. And so the isosbestic will no longer exist. It will, it will drift. But so long as only these two, the, all the rhodium in the system is in the form of A or B, the absorptivity of the solution will stay right there, no matter what the proportion of A and B is. And what we find when we titrate the solution with uh, HCl is that this isosbestic holds until we've introduced one more chloride for the astenyl astronate. Um, that tells a couple of things. Uh, an important one being that no uh, HCl was consumed. You see, part of the HCl might have been used to give this and a little bit and, and some of it to take the reaction on further to uh, this hypothetical uh, ion that contains two chlorides. And if that occurred, you would have removed some of the rhodium that way. But since the isobestic held until the ratio of added chloride was one to one, that means that these were the only two species in the solution while you were adding HCl. That this reaction is a favored one with respect to further reaction onto the uh, onto this ion, the uh, ion C that we talked about. Once you get past past out of the range of this isobestic, a new isobestic is formed down here, and that means that we are now converting. B into some other rhodium species. That isosbestic, the new one, holds not only when we add one more chloride, which would have been enough if it were only used for that purpose to convert B into C, but even when you go past this point, you have to add, uh, well, there is just uh, no change in that isobestic until you've added a third, chlor a third mole of HCl to the solution. 
um, it appears that while, while you're going from B to C, uh, you're on, all the time that you're at going from one HCL to about three or 3.3, something like, like that, HCLs, that there are only two colored species in the system, namely B and C, because the isosbestic is not changing. If it were going further, you'd be the isobestic would disappear. And that means it can be interpreted in either of two ways. One is that this equilibrium is so strongly in the direction of the B compound that although some of this is being formed, it is not substantially converted over. There's enough... Uh, uh, well, it means that if there's a, the, there is a new compound being formed because the isopestic changes. It's going to something. The extent you don't know because the only reason you know there's a change is because a new location for the isopestic. You know something else is happening. Something is happening to the rhodium. You don't know how much is happening. It might all go. It might be that the second mole takes you all the way to this, and the further addition of HCl is just adding a transparent substance to the, to the reaction mixture and not doing anything else. Or it may be that the amount of C which is formed is small when you get to, is relatively small, when you have added the second chloride, which might have been enough to convert it all to this form, but only a, a certain proportion rate. At any rate, we know that there is a new compound being formed. And uh, that formulation uh, appears to be a reasonable one. Now, when you get up to about, to about three or three and a half, there, there's... Uh, the isobestic holds up to about three, and, and, and then it gets to be tricky at, uh, at reading the uh, uh, curves, whether it goes much above three or not, because the, the, the departure from the lines is, is slow. The next, you notice that the whole sol solution is changing color in the cell. Uh, that the absorption is general and it's out. Uh, there, there's nothing anymore. There's no isobestic formed anymore. So added more hydrochloric acid to uh, to the acetyl astronate. And we did get evidence of that through the formation of isosbestic points in a titration of of the acetyl astronate with hydrogen chloride. Now, uh, I guess in order to make that convincing, I ought to uh, say what an isosbestic point is and how it works. Um, we can assume that the acetyl acetonate complex and this uh, ethylene chloride dimer um, will have uh, different spectra. It's true that the dimer will be very is sparingly soluble, but you can get solutions concentrated enough so that you can get a spectrum of it. And let's assume that we do make uh, a solution of uh, the acetyl astronate, and we get its spectrum, which might be, oh, something like this. Um, where you go along the way, the, the, the absorptivity of the solution uh, would be the y-axis of this drawing, and, and the uh, wavelength is along the x-axis. And assume that... Uh, 
this diethylene rhodium chloride dimer also uh, has a spectrum which um, is certainly not identical with this, but it looks uh, something, uh, well, well, to define an isbestic, I can write something like this. Now you notice that there is one point here where the, they have the this solutions of the same strength have the same absorptivity. And so if we add hydrogen chloride to our acetylacetonate complex and some of it changes to the bridge complex, the absorptivity and nothing else, the absorptivity at this point will not change. It'll stay fixed at that, at that place. And uh, of course, if some other material is formed, which has another different spectrum, then the ro part of the rhodium will be used up that was in these species. And so the isosbestic will no longer exist. The, will, it will drift. But so long as only these two, the, all the rhodium in the system is in the form of A or B, the absorptivity of the solution will stay right there, no matter what the proportion of A and B is. And what we find when we titrate the solution with uh, HCl is that this isosbestic holds until we've introduced one more chloride for the astenyl astronate. Um, that tells a couple of things. Uh, an important one being that no uh, HCl was consumed. You see, part of the HCl might have been used to give this and a little bit and, and some of it to take the reaction on further to uh, this hypothetical uh, ion that contains two chlorides. And if that occurred, you would have removed some of the rhodium that way. But since the isobestic held until the ratio of added chloride was one to one, that means that these were the only two species in the solution while you were adding HCl. That this reaction is a favored one with respect to further reaction onto the uh, onto this ion, the uh, ion C that we talked about. Once you get past, past out of the range of this isobestic, a new isobestic is formed down here. And that means that we are now converting B into some other rhodium species. That isosbestic, the new one, holds not only when we add one more chloride, which would have been enough if it were only used for that purpose to convert B into C. But even when you go past this point, you have to add, uh, well, there is just, uh, no change in that isobestic until you've added a third, chlor a third mole of HCl to the solution. Um, it appears that while, while you're going from B to C, uh, you're all, all the time that you're at going from one HCl to about 3 or 3.3, something like, like that, HCLs, that there are only two colored species in the system, namely B and C, because the isosbestic is not changing. If it were going further, you'd be, the isobestic would disappear. And that means it can be interpreted in either of two ways. One is that this equilibrium is so strongly in the direction 
of the B compound that although some of this is being formed, it is not substantially converted over. There's enough, uh, uh, well, it means that if there's a, the, there is a new compound being formed because the isopestic changes. It's going to something. The extent you don't know because the only reason you know there's a change is because a new location for the isopestic. You know something else is happening. Something is happening to the rhodium. You don't know how much is happening. It might all go. It might be that the second mole takes you all the way to this. And the further addition of HCl is just adding a transparent substance to the, to the reaction mixture and not doing anything else. Or it may be that the amount of C which is formed is small when you get to, is relatively small when you have added the second chloride, which might have been enough to convert it all to this form, but only a, a certain proportion rate. At any rate, we know that there is a new compound being formed. And uh, that formulation uh, appears to be a reasonable one. Now, when you get up to about, to about three, or three and a half, there, there's, uh, the isbestic holds up to about three, and, and, and then it gets to be tricky at, uh, at reading the uh, uh, curves, whether it goes much above three or not, because the, the, the departure from the lines is, is slow. The next, you notice that the whole sol solution is changing color in the cell, uh, that the absorption is general and it's out. Uh, there, there's nothing anymore. There's no isbestic formed anymore. So we assume that s from the change in color that we have done the step of introducing a hydride and given us the color change, and we've added a hydrogen chloride molecule to it this way. Um, now, we've never been able to isolate that hydride. Uh, made real hard efforts, low temperatures to try to catch uh, that hydride. And we're not able to get it. I think that, uh, I really think it's possible that uh, an attempt to find a hydride in such reactions was part of what was back of trying to get, uh, to have Ch Chad Tolman get uh, this very, uh, this apparatus together for measuring very fast reactions to try to to catch that reaction on the fly. But uh, this, this step four uh, occurs so very fast that uh, we're, uh, we just never see any sign of it. However, we were able to uh, confirm the reality of compound E by uh, work with, with NMR. Um, what we did was to start with, the, with this bridged complex, uh, the diethylene rhodium chloride dimer. We didn't want to get the protons of acetyl acetone in the NMR tube to mess up the proton signal. And we treated that with, with HCl at minus 35 degrees. Now that, if, if this material is formed, it should not have been able to undergo the rearrangement to the, to the butyl group. And the NMR spectra uh, show up that point very nicely. 
Um, here's a, a rough chart, a couple of rough charts about what, uh, what occurs. Now, this is the reaction system that I've described in, in, done in alcohol. And this absorption is the absorption characteristic of the methyl group, uh, the methyl part of an ethyl group. It is a triplet. It, is, it comes rather high in the up, up, upper field. All of this material down here is the secondary butyl group and coordinate ethylene. You have to take that a little bit on my word. You feel that your fingers are sort of crossed on that because it's not exactly a clear-cut definition. But when we use the cyclopentadienyl complex, which we can do at, at, uh, and uh, run conveniently at low temperatures, and run this experiment in deuterated chloroform, we see at, at a temperature of now a temperature of minus 50 degrees because it, run, it runs through the, that reaction sequence analogous to this all the way to there at minus 50 degrees. Here again is the methyl group of the ethylene of the ethyl group. Here is the methylene group of the ethyl group. And this is the absorption due to the ethylene that's still coordinated. So uh, with the cyclopentadienyl complex, you have, of course, the cyclopentadienyl group and the ethyl group and, and ethylene. And if you let this, this solution stand for about 20 minutes at minus 10 degrees, things have begun to change. You still have some of the ethyl, of the methyl group there, but you have a flock of absorption in here, which is due now to the, uh, to the butyl group since reactions in, in chloroform are a lot faster, there's probably uh, some butene, or possibly some butene in there. Uh, and there is the ethylene to be considered and the methylene group of the other. But a clear, a clearly here, uh, something has happened to the ethyl group that was on there originally. That, that spectrum uh, of the cyclopentadienyl group in chloroform was, was a real nice convincer to have. Man. But uh, if, as we propose, This is the species which is reacting. There should be some kinetic proof that, th that some kinetic consequences of that being the slow reaction. And one of the things that you can do is to try to prove that the reaction is, depends not only on the, depends individually on the concentration of the species that make up that complex which we arrange is. Namely, it depends on the concentration of, of ethylene in the reaction system, the concentration of rhodium, the concentration of, of chloride, and the concentration of, of, of proton. And uh, so, uh, we, we studied the influence of all of those factors on the reaction by setting up reaction systems in which 
uh, the limiting factor was one of the on the rate of reaction was one of those species, uh, ethylene or rhodium or or chloride or, or proton, and then ran the reactions. Now, the the results of that are sh are shown on these charts. The first is the concentration factor concentration of rhodium. And you see, as the rhodium concentration comes down to zero, approaches, goes down towards zero, that the rate is linear and it depends on the concentration of rhodium and it becomes zero and the concentration of rhodium is zero, which is not, not amazing. Um, when you study the effect of the hydrogen ion concentration, Again, as the hydrogen ion concentration is lowered, here we use lithium chloride instead of uh, instead of uh, HCl, so we can affect the chloride concentration without the hydrogen ion. And again, we get this rate coming down to zero as the only when the concentration of uh, of hydrogen ion is, is at near zero. But the striking thing about chloride effect of chloride ion concentration is the fact that the rate becomes zero before the concentration of chloride ion comes to zero. In fact, you start making uh, butene only when the ratio of chloride to rhodium is in the range of about uh, between 3 and 4 to 1. And then uh, at least the extrapolation says that reaction stops then. Uh, there's no way to get extrapolation over here. And of course that is consistent with the uh, with uh, what has been said about the uh, uh, about the in the, in the spectral work, where you you have to get that much chloride in to start having an active catalyst, and th this is uh, consistent with that formulation of the uh, of the. Uh, of the com compound E as the and reaction five as the uh, rate determining step. Um, and in in of the compounds that are here, we have spectral evidence of for the existence of it of at least one intermediate between these uh, this seems a, a reasonable a, a, a an almost in, uh, unavoidable uh, step to have added to have gone to four coordination to take the bridge complex to four coordination and the hydride as uh, like all these hydrides, they have been detected on some other uh, reactions of transition metals, but uh, not in the circumstances of having a, an olefin coordinate. And as far as we're concerned, uh, we just saw no evidence of that material. But we did see evidence of the conversion of rhodium-1 to rhodium-3. Now, having done that, we ran rate determinations on the overall reaction to uh, learn what the uh, to, to learn what the uh, act activation energy is for the reaction, and uh, uh, the results are, sh are shown here. 
These are reactions which were run in the ethanol water mixture using one molar HCl, a reaction solution one molar in HCl, uh, 6,700 uh, molar in rhodium. These were run in the uh, in the uh, biologist's apparatus, the uh, Warburg Warburg apparatus. Yes, it's, it's a very convenient thing to use. Uh, you could get all the reactants together in separate compartments of one of these Warburg flasks. And when everything was brought to temperature, mix them up and start your study. The ethylene pressure in the system that we studied went from from a, a couple of, near a couple of atmospheres, 1,100 millimeters, down to 10 millimeters, through to 98 percent reaction. They, uh, uh, the lines were plottable that way. Some of the reactions went overnight. Uh, but these are the these are the uh, rate the, the rate constants that we got at 10 degrees, 30 degrees, and 50 degrees, and the rate plots out to an expression that indicates uh, uh, an activation energy it's a 17 point kilocalorie. When you translate this into uh, the uh, energy involved in an, an, an activated complex, it comes out that the, uh, the heat of activation has 16 point, well, you can, can uh, see 16.6 kilocalories and read off the free energy change and the entropy change of, uh, of activation that's involved. They're not very, very different from a similar insertion reaction uh, of uh, carbon monoxide between uh, methyl group and, and uh, manganese to give an acetyl group, uh, formally there is some difference in that the, in this case the ethylene is self-contained, whereas here, the carbon monoxide comes in independently. But uh, it, it, it does give us a view of the energy that's required to, to complete the reaction. Now, there are a couple of side reactions that are involved here that I've kept covered up by chart, and I'd like to go to those first. Um, this reaction, 9, is the dissociation of ethylene from the, uh, this key species which undergoes rearrangement. If you, if you make up a solution, starting from here and carry it to that, that stage, uh, you notice that uh, you'll find ethylene in the atmosphere over the reaction mixture after the reaction is finished. And the only possible source of that ethylene is, is from this complex. Um, so we, we uh, studied that reaction. And one of the things that you can do first is to try to isolate this compound. Uh, to do that, we pumped all the ethylene out of a solution of this com of the uh, of complex E, the ethylene ethyl complex, and then added cesium salt, cesium chloride to it, and precipitated a cesium salt of uh, this, this species. Now, uh, the, the analysis of that salt shows it corresponds to having, with each cesium, there is associated one C2H5 
or the carbons and hydrogens in that, one rhodium, three chlorides, and one molecule of H2O. Um, that means we've got to we got to write it with two solvent with one solvent molecule instead of two. And if you insist on keeping the six coordinate thing in mind, I recall you back to the to the form of this complex and suggest that that this material can have the formula with one H2O there by forming a bridged complex uh, like this where uh, one chloride serves the purpose of two if there's no if there is no dimerization of that sort. Um, we measured the some some of the uh, kinetics and uh, equilibria in the dissociation of ethylene from from that complex, and these those results are shown on this table. Now, uh, this is for the reaction that we're looking at is the uh, loss of a molecule of ethylene to give this complex, the ethyl complex. And you can approach the equilibrium either by letting it stand and let the ethylene come off and measuring the ethylene, the amount of ethylene that's produced. Or you can pump in ethylene on it and on a solution of the compound that has had the ethylene removed in and find out up how much you can follow the reaction in, in both directions. And these equilibrium constants were at, attained that way. From the rates at minus 15, minus 25, and minus 35, we wanted to find the rate at room temperature of course, you can't measure that, in fact, because you'd run into the dimerization reaction. But we can extrapolate these results to 30 degrees. And if we do that, we find that the rate constant is, is 0.35, 3 hundredths. But it, it, it's, a, I think, a little more clear if we talk in terms of the amount of material which is dissociated so to speak. Um, and at, and at uh, 30 degrees, and with a pressure of one atmosphere on the solution, you find that 80% of the rhodium made in this couple, 80% is in the form of the ethylene-free complex, and only 20% is in the form of the uh, of, of complex nine, which has both the ethyl group and the ethylene in it. Um, of course, if you increase the pressure in the reaction, the concentration of this species will increase. And this dependence uh, is also consistent on the fact that the rate varies with the concentration of ethylene. The higher the concentration of ethylene, the higher the concentration of this species is influenced by that equilibrium. <coughs> uh, the rate of dissociation, again measured at minus 15 and my, to minus 35 degrees, the values are listed here. Uh, the extrapolated rate at 30 degrees, uh, 3.5, is a moderately fast reaction. Um, but it's interesting, at this point, I think we have the data to compare the stability and the rate of exchange of ethylene in the complex of rhodium-1 with that of a rhodium-3 compound. And for the rhodium-1 compound, we select the acetyl acetonate. And you find that it does not dissociate measurably uh, 
at, at all in solution. You, you don't have ethylene free over a solution of, of the acetyl acetonate. But the exchange rate is tremendously fast. Exchange uh, with ethylene ed. If you mix, set, mix up an, an NMR tube and you, can, you put into it the acetyl acetonate complex and ethylene gas, the NMR signal that you get has only one peak in it, and that is the average of the free and the coordinate ethylene. The exchange is so fast that at the frequency of uh, at which the uh, NMR is taken, which is uh, generally uh, 60 uh, m millihertz, uh, it, it cannot distinguish. It, it's all it's all one kind of ethylene that it sees. On the other hand, as we just as we just been talking, this rhodium three complex, which contains ethylene, is eighty percent dissociated at room temperature, um, and the rate is far slower. The stability is lower, the dissociation is, is far easier, but the rate of exchange is, uh, is uh, at least 10,000 times, uh, one thousandth the rate. Um, this does, in, of course, reflect the mechanism that's available for exchange here. Uh, if you consider the acetyl acetonate complex, it's a square planar complex, and it has free electrons on it. But it, it, it is not completely filled, and so the shell is not completely filled, so it can accommodate a nucleophile attacking it. And so momentarily, uh, a, an incoming ethylene molecule can attach itself to rhodium to give, as an intermediate, essentially a complex of acetyl acetone with three ethylenes on it, and then one is lost by exchange. The mechanism for exchange uh, in this case is uncertain. Um, I hope. Uh, I'd like to talk with you about some possibilities of exchange in such a complex. I, I think it's probably died by dissociation uh, rather than uh, uh, any sort of bimolecular reaction, but uh, uh, I'd prefer to touch on that later. Let's turn back to the bottom row of reactions here, which are concerned with the isomerization of one butene. You probably recall that the, uh, although one butene appeared to be the primary product, that uh, uh, the two, two butenes, cis and trans, were also formed in the reaction. Uh, and the way that this occurred would be a way this could occur by a reaction of this intermediate uh, in the cycle, which contains one butene as a ligand being reacting with hydrogen chloride again to form a three rhodium complex with with hydrogen attached to rhodium, and then an uh, addition of hydrogen, but this time to the terminal carbon rather than the internal carbon, and so give you a secondary butyl group attached to rhodium. And, and when that is reduced to rhodium-1 by loss of the hydrogen as a proton, you get a coordination, a uh, a, uh, com a, a coordination compound of rhodium and, and butene. As it's written here, 
cis-2-butene, but uh, trans-2-butene is also likely. Now, it... Oh, it, it right there, we'll take a break. We've got to change the tape. Right. And that's a good point for the... As I say, we have a, an isomerization occurring by these steps. And uh, in explaining it, I've started with this complex of one butene. Right. As a matter of fact, in the reaction system, one butene, which has been formed and displaced, can compete for coordination with rhodium. In fact, we measured the equilibrium be, uh, between coordination of 1-butene as opposed to rhodium. And the ratio is about 10 to 1. Ethylene's favored by uh, a factor of about uh, uh, multiple of 10 over coordination of 1-butene. So that you can have uh, a complex similar to this formed from 1-butene or, in fact, the 2-butenes that are formed in the reaction. Sure. And these will be present uh, to some degree as soon as reaction starts. It's, it's a, the only way you can avoid or minimize the isomerization is to flood your reaction with ethylene. And to the extent that you can keep the excess of ethylene high enough to overcome, to, to, to take advantage of this ratio, uh, you, can, uh, you can minimize isomerization. Uh, we did, in, in later work, we made a study of the, the isomerization of uh, butenes in this synthesis system. And this gives you a uh, an idea of the relative rates of the reactions by which uh, isomerization occurs. Uh, you, and you see the slowest sort of isomerization is going from trans uh, two butene back to one butene, which still can occur. Your isomerization, if you're looking for one butene, your isomerization can be uh, be helpful to you if if you start with either of these. The fastest reaction is for one butene to give you the uh, cis uh, two butene, which is what was was drawn on the chart. Well, I believe that finishes uh, the evidence and the consequences. Uh, the evidence is for and the consequences of the mechanism uh, for, but for ethylene isomerization that, that were worked out. Um, Very convincing. Well, I hope so. <laughs> At least I, I, I was more easily convinced than most, I think. I, I would like to mention some reactions of that very wonderful cyclopentadienyl complex that I've mentioned in passing in the past. It, it has, there have been some intriguing things come out uh, that describe uh, the sorts of things that uh, press this idea of the ethylene metal bond to its limits. 
and uh, uh, give you a lot of angles on it. Anyway, as I say, I came to this cyclopentadienyl complex through uh, Bruce King, and he just turned over the material to me. And one of the first things I did was to get the NMR spectrum, and right away it looked suspicious. Now here's a trace of the NMR spectrum, and there are several things that are piled up on this chart, and so you, you have to follow my description here pretty closely, but at room temperature, the absorption, th this is a cyclopentadienyl group, and it's always located way down in the field. But the uh, room temperature spectrum is traced out here in green. Looks like a couple of breasts. Uh, uh, two kinds of protons for the ethylene that's there. There are two kinds of, of ethylene stored there. The thing is very temperature sensitive. And if you go up to in temperature, here at 55 degrees, the cleavage is narrowed, and you've got one hump at 55 degrees. That's the blue line. The separation has disappeared. There's some change occurring. This is what happens when uh, you're getting uh, a change of environment, which is getting in terms of the speed of of NMR detectum, detection. Uh, IR would be a lot faster. That motion is a lot faster. But, but, uh, but you see two, two kinds of hydrogens are sort of transposed. And when you bring the temperature up to 180 degrees, you get a single uh, absorption. It's a double because rhodium affects the hydrogen signal and splits it into a double. It, is, it has an odd number of electrons, and so mm -hmm. it, it, it splits the hydrogen signal. And it's a double. And, and real narrow, and as far as, as far as NMR can see, there's only one kind of, of ethylene hydrogens in the molecule. If you go the other way and cut down the temperature, here at zero degrees, these rather broad things have sharpened up. You can see the rhodium splitting on each one. Uh, you can uh, see other uh, splitting by in interaction, just as in the uh, methyl group, uh, in, in, in ethanol, you see splitting of the methyl group and of of the due to the hydrogens that are on the right, on the methylene right. and so on, and so the other hydrogens have an effect of splitting those signals, and that combined splitting gives you this sort of signal for the ethylene. Well, evidently we've got two kinds of, of of hydrogens in that, and the problem is to try to find out. Uh, what, what's the cause of it? What's going on that makes them different? And the first thing, an obvious thing that occurred to you is, well, maybe it's because they're dissociating or exchanging somehow. And so we tried to see how fast this molecule will exchange, the, the, ethyl, the ethylene in this molecule will exchange with free ethylene. Well, it doesn't. You can mix a perdeuterated ethylene with this complex and heat them up to 100 degrees and there's no dissociation in a matter of hours. So it's not, it's not a dissociation. And so the, next, the next thing you say, well, it must be some sort of way that the molecules move around. Even, I had mentioned way back about Chat's description of the coordination of ethylene to platinum. And he spoke of it as being a bond between the double bonds of ethylene to the rhodium and a bond uh, to the carbon atoms of ethylene to rhodium. 
And maybe what could be involved here is a breaking of one of those bonds or ethylene coming loose at one end or something like that. So we made the complex similar to this, but one that had uh, one uh, five hexadiene to replace both ethylenes. So essentially you had this complex, but it was tied together at one end with a C2H4 group. And that compound gave you this sort of, uh, gave you this sort of signal for the hydrogens. There was no more of the motion. And that looked more like rotation mm -hmm. uh, as being the cause of the difference. Right. So um, we tried to get more data on the behavior uh, of the rotation. It looked like what we were doing, in fact, was breaking one of the bonds that holds ethylene to rhodium. And so we wanted to find out how strong that bond is. Now, you can do, the, you want to find the rate of the rotation, you want to find how strong the bond is by analysis of NMR spectra at different temperatures. And we did that uh, with data that we accumulated uh, and, and got figures. But uh, when Jack Roberts was, uh, was consulting with us, and he was, was something of an NMR expert. Uh, he looked at what we had and he, he uh, sort of put down the uh, sensitivity of the analysis that we were doing. And uh, he said that he had out at Caltech uh, a computer system worked out where, whereby he could, by feeding in the proper Co coupling constants, that is, the way these lines were split out by, right. by uh, the hydrogens elsewhere, he could reproduce these molecules and what would happen if they went or changed. I should say that we could identify what each of these peaks was, was due to. These were due to the hydrogens on the inside. That is, if I, if I draw a, a molecule of, the eth, of these ethylenes, say we put rhodium here in the middle, and then we have a bond going out to the ethylenes. And we could tell the ethylenes were put were about like were about on about like that because we had done a had a crystal structure done on this molecule, and uh, when you do that, you find that the now looking down on the top of the molecule, the rhodium is in the center, and here we have bonds going out to an ethylene molecule. And now we're looking down. We're looking. We're looking down on the top. We're looking through the ethylene molecule, right. which is standing upright, and it has another ethylene molecule. And it has a cyclopentadienyl group. Now the angle between these is. Uh, 90 degrees, which looks like square planar. The angle here is 135 degrees each side. And you can, you can sort of reconcile yourself to, okay, it is, it is yellow, so it's rhodium-1. And this sort of takes the place of a pair of ligands over here as far as structure is concerned. At least you know that the rhodium and these bonds all lie in one plane. And that means that the center of the ethylene and the cyclopentadiene are all coplanar with the rhodium. And that seems like good. Now, uh, if we start looking at the 
that the carbon's on this. There are hydrogens here and here and here. Now, and, and we have similar hydrogens on this ethylene. Now, when we uh, put the hexadiene, bring that into consideration, we put a bridge across and we lose that hydrogen. All right, now we can look at our signal and from the size of the peaks, we can see what the two different hydrogens are. The ones that here, which we'll call inside hydrogens, are only half as many of them as there are the outside hydrogens. And so we look at our spectrum and we see of the, of the uh, hexadienyl complex, and we see which one has the bigger peak. And it turns out this is the signal that's due to the inside hydrogen, this to the, to the outside hydrogens. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, where do I? So we, we've identified ev everything that's on that. And we found that it does not exchange uh, by, it does not exchange with, with, with ethylene. Now, it, it's reached a rare, it's, because it's reached a rare gas configuration. There's no place for a nucleophile to sit down on it without going up to the next higher shell of electrons. And that's a high energy step, and it doesn't happen easily. But we do have an extra pair of electrons on it. And so maybe a Lewis acid would do something with it. Maybe it would coordinate with it, or maybe cause something to happen. Well, if you treat this compound with sulfur dioxide, which is a Lewis acid, mild one, you immediately get reaction. Apparently, you've, you've picked up the two electrons on rhodium, and it changes color, and you can guess what that is. That is now gone from yellow to red, and real intense red. Uh, if you, in just a few minutes, it starts to effervesce, the solution starts to effervesce. And I take that to be ethylene, com ethylene coming off. Uh, one ethylene is displaced, and you now have a cyclopentadienyl complex with one ethylene and one sulfur dioxide. Now that should do something to your bonds in your molecule. And you take the NMR spectrum of that sulfur dioxide complex. A good thing to use as a rough measure of the strength of that uh, bonding that gives you the three-membered ring, the, the one that's breaking in this, right. is the temperature at which this convergence occurs uh, of those separate lines. And there are separate lines in the sulfur dioxide complex, and they do not converge until you get chilled down to zero degrees. But at, at zero degrees, it's converged because the sulfur dioxide has loosened up that bond, and the bond between, sulfur di uh, between ethylene and rhodium is less dependent on the bonds to the outside carbon. They break more easily and more dependent on the bond from the double bonds of ethylene into the rhodium. Uh, you can do, you can affect the strength of that bond in various ways. You can use compounds with substituted cyclopentadiene. And if you put a cyano uh, compound, uh, cyano C5 on, or a carboxy uh, methyl C5, 
the temperature is reduced to uh, uh, 20, 20 degrees for the convergent of that line. You don't have you don't have broad things like this at 20 degrees. That that substitution of cyclopentadienyl group has done that. On the other hand, <laughs> if you use the pentamethyl cyclopentadiene right. complex, you stiffen it up so that the uh, convergence temperature is about 65 degrees. But the, the real uh, breaker in all this, the real extreme case in all this, uh, mercury chloride can form complexes by acting as a Lewis acid and coordinate with rhodium here. Now, when you do that, you keep your ethylenes. You now have a complex with, with mercury chloride coordinate there. The mercury chloride complex shows this sort of signal no matter how cold we can get it in our NMR equipment. The bond, the, the bond to the upper carbons has ceased to be a, a very important part mm -hmm. of, the, of the bonding uh, uh, business. It's all that bond where uh, rhodium has, if you like, has become so much of a popper in terms of electrons that uh, it pulls the electrons of the coordinated ethylene, it, it, its attraction for them, makes that, that bond, the, the, the thing holding the molecule together. Uh, and it's a, a real striking thing. Um, so um, here we are uh, with with these facts on the cyclopentadienyl complex. Now there's one one uh, more experiment that I'd like to to, to uh, talk with you about. I I think you were. Deep in, uh, you were deep in biochemistry when I d when I did this. When I that may not right. have known, I may not have known mm -hmm. about it. Um, I call it the George Kistiakowsky Memorial Experiment because uh, he thought that that kinetics, even consideration of reactions in the liquid phase, was anathema. Uh, the only way you could talk about collision of molecules was in the gas phase. And as soon as you got a solvent in, that messed things up. And I guess you see that sort of thing in organic chemistry because Hammett warns you about the effect of solvent on, uh, on displacement reactions in organic chemists. And it is a real problem with coordination chemists where you keep keep getting the, sol the solvent mixing in uh, with the reactions. Uh, but this experiment uh, went at the question, I don't think I'm, I mentioned what the energy was that Jack Roberts got for that bond no. uh, that, that uh, was broken in the rotation. And what he found by matching his computer uh, computer NMR spectra with the real thing was an activation energy of 14.2 uh, uh, plus or minus 0.6 kilocalories, uh, which mm -hmm. he regarded as a real firm figure. And it's a substantial bond strength, but still not, not huge. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, was, th there was one possibility for exchange that we wanted to look into and wanted to do it in the gas phase. It happens that this ethylene complex is volatile. You can, you can uh, sublime it to purify it. And uh, in a, a, a pressure of uh, around 10 millimeters, it sublimes fairly fast. Uh, 
a tenth of a mole in uh, will sublime in about an hour at a pressure of 10, 10 millimeters. So he thought to take, use a carrier gas and get it to pick up some of this complex and put it through a hot tube and see whether uh, uh, there was some temperature at which it would uh, break apart and right. that way give us some clue to the uh, strength of it, the total strength of the bond between, uh, I guess, roughly speaking, the sum of the two bonds that, that, right. that held the ethylene to the rhodium. And uh, we found that if uh, the gas mixture that would go through the tube, we use CO2 as a carrier gas, and the gas mixture that went through the tube contained about 99.7% CO2 and about three-tenths of a percent of this complex. And after the reaction was over, we would uh, um, uh, absorb the carbon dioxide in alkali, measure the ethylene by, by volume, and identify it as, by NMR as being the only species left. We would uh, recover the unreacted material uh, right. by sublimation into a, a, an ice container and mm -hmm. uh, from heated apparatus, and so make a recovery of material that was pyrolyzed, and we get back about 90 to 95 percent. Account for 90 to 95 percent of this material either as ethylene or as, as uh, unreacted complex. At temperatures in the order of 200 to 280 degrees, um, this, diso this decomposition in, at a contact time of about five seconds uh, would decompose to the extent at the low temperature of about 25 percent, the high temperature about 95 percent. And so we ran that reaction and we measured the uh, uh, amount of material that decomposed. Uh, now to make sure that we were measuring the rate of, of an ethylene clipping off of the rhodium, we tried to experiment using ethylene as a carrier gas. And now, whereas if we use CO2, we got 95% dissociation. With ethylene as a carrier gas, and under these conditions, uh, we, we recovered uh, at least 90% of this complex unchanged because the ethylene, it, with enough ethylene around it, uh, the ethylene would pop off, but it'd go back on again. Sure. So that certainly that was something we were looking at. Very nice. And from that, we calculated the energy bond in the gas phase per Kistikowski mm -hmm. of 31 kilocalories for what it takes to, to crack off that, the, the ethylene. And just to make sure we were, were playing fair and giving the solution, the liquid phase chemists are due, we measured the rate of dissociation in the liquid phase. We used uh, uh, diphenyl ether as a solvent, and we heated this up in diphenyl ether solution with various ligands that, that would replace ethylene if it were free and remove mm -hmm. the solution. And you can imagine two situations, the first step being similar to what we had done in the gas phase, where one ethylene came off and one ligand went on. But we had another ethylene there that was going to come off. And it might come off real fast as an influence of the ligand that was on there, or it might essentially take the same, require the same thing as 
the, the initial step did to put on the first day. But uh, unless something, some unexpected complication occurred, we expected that the rates would lie between within a, a figure or twice that figure if, mm -hmm. if both of those reactions were involved in the overall rate. And uh, we used a, a variety of ligands for that replacing group, nitrogen compounds, triphenylphosphine, cyclooctadiene, where you had, and other chelating compounds. And what we, f we found examples of both types, but the uh, things like cyclooctadiene, uh, the, second, the second one came off real fast. They had the same, they had the lowest, the, the, the figure of the lowest rate rather than the double of that. So we measured the rate with cyclodioctene, di, cyclodioctene. Uh, oct cyclooctadiene there I got right. right, as the replacing ligand at mm -hmm. different temperatures. And that gave us a value of 29 kilocalories compared with George's 31 kilocalories, mm -hmm. which is not terribly different. That's and, right, very close. And, and, uh, and worked out. So that, that cyclopendiene complex was, was a wonderful thing and just good fortune that I got in my hands to work with. I'm sure the combination of your kinetics of the cyclopentadiene decomposition plus all of your work on the ethylene dimerization uh, gave a very satisfying picture to you to study your reaction so completely and uh, it, it get such did, a nice it picture did, it of it. It was, it was a sort, sort of self-generating experience where you had one good thing happening after another mm -hmm. and you were anxious to get back in and do it again. Was uh, Werner at the ETH? Was Werner at the Eigenosa Technical Hochschule in Zurich? I'm I don't know. Well, he, I Bachmann, know I know he I know he he was a Swiss. Well, I think he's at ETH because Bachman told me about going in the places where they had research samples there and sample after sample after sample of Werner's stuff. It's re it's really fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that book, you know, um, I, I don't know how people form, formulated Well, Dick, whatever got you to go from Juniata to Harvard? Well, that's just, that's sort of a funny story. I, I came to the end of my four, toward the end of my four years at Juniata. And I wanted to go to graduate school. I expected to go to graduate school if I could get in any place. I didn't have any money, that was for sure. I had to have some sort of financial help. So I wrote to, it was a copy of uh, Chemical Reviews, I guess it was. Anyway, some of them had a list of, of graduate schools in it. I think I wrote to about 15 graduate schools to ask for admission. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to go to Princeton. Uh, and I made a, made a trip to, to Princeton. It's the only place I made to for an interview. And uh, I'm afraid I flunked the interview mm -hmm. as uh, I got, uh, it, it was a sort of an oral test part of it. And the man who was tough on me was the thermodynamics man at Princeton. Mm -hmm. And he he tied me up. I I, I fumbled it there. Um, I wrote to Michigan. Mm -hmm. I wrote to University of Illinois. I um, uh, but what happened uh, was that I got an acceptance from Harvard. Real, I got an acceptance with a promise of money from Harvard before most of the schools reacted. It turned out that the man who was the head of the department and the man for whom I, for, for whom I made these cobalt complexes, yes. um, an old bachelor, uh, had as a very good friend a man who was uh, a dean at the uh, uh, business school at Harvard. And he talked with Kohler 
uh, my chemistry prof at Juniata uh, asked him to push my candidacy for a And he talked with Kohler, mm -hmm. whom he knew in the faculty club. And he said to Kohler, why don't you have good, uh, room for a good Pennsylvania Dutchman <laughs> <laughs> in your candidate? And of course, that, that might have been some appeal to Kohler. Uh -huh. And so I got this letter offering me a, a fellowship and opportunity to go to school there. So I wrote to all the other places and turned them down. I, uh, I, I wanted to accept this and I, I, right away to make sure I had something. And uh, Princeton had told me that they would enroll me, but they wouldn't give me any financial help. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I heard from either Michigan or Illinois. Was it settled then that you'd be working with Kohler when you went to Harvard? No, oh no, by not by any means. At this point, I figured I was going to work for 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 Conant, uh, mm -hmm. James B. Conant. When I I talked this over with my profs at Juniata, and especially the organic prof, was oh, what a tremendous opportunity. He was a Yale man himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What a tremendous opportunity to do research under Conant. Um, what? I, w I went under rather stringent uh, financial circumstances because although I uh, had this fellowship that paid $800, maybe 850 I fr had to plunk down 500 of that for tuition at Harvard. <laughs> and so for living expenses, I had very little left. But anyway... Uh, I went went to Harvard, and then we had this interview with. Uh, uh, well, I should say first that they were a little bit. My background at Juniata was a little suspect. They had uh, a number of small schools, not, not dozens, but about a half dozen or so small schools um, that they, from which they selected. Mm -hmm. uh, their students. And after I got admitted, uh, Archie Barkdahl, you know, went yes, up. Yes, I knew he followed you. Yes. Very shortly. And, and there was a reasonable flow of junior people from then on. Uh, I remember William Jewell College was represented. That's a school in Missouri. Mm -hmm. I don't know that school. Uh, one that you have heard of, I'm sure, but always, I guess there was almost one Emory man in every class at, at Harvard. Uh, every class in graduate school, there was an Emory man mm -hmm. there. There were other schools like that. Well, I get back on on interviews. We had interviews with the people in the in the faculty, not n not in a group, but man to man. And uh, of course, but I had dreamed about Conant in the spring, but. During the summer, he accepted the presidency of Harvard College, and he was no, no longer possible to work with him. And uh, so I went to Harvard, not being very sure whom I wanted to work with, but uh, uh, still feeling I was going to work in organic, chem in organic chemistry. And uh, Professor Kohler was the the head of the department, that mm -hmm. looked like it was pretty good. And then uh, the gossip that I heard when I was at Harvard treated him with a great deal of respect and, uh, and mentioned all the, the good chemists that he had trained. Uh, and I guess he hadn't trained uh, any man at Michigan, but he certainly covered the, the Middle West pretty well. The, head of department at Illinois, Roger Adams was one of his students, and at Minnesota, Lee Irving Smith was one of his students, and uh, at Iowa, who's the man who wrote the, the organic chemistry book at Gilman? Iowa? Gilman. Gilman was one of his mm -hmm. students. Uh, you were in very good company. Uh, Frank... Uh, Whitmore? Whitmore was yes, one I of his students. That. Art Cope was one of his... No, Art Cope was... was Conant's student. Well, Conant was one of his students. Mm -hmm. 
it looked, looked like he'd be a good man to work with. So I went to him to talk about it, and he said, well, you know, I'm, an, I'm getting old, and I, my research is in pretty well fixed in the area that it is. You really ought to, my best advice to you is to go and, and talk with Paul Bartlett about, Paul Bartlett had come in to replace Conant in the mm -hmm. Department of Chemistry at Harvard. Go and talk with Paul Bartlett and see what problems he has to offer you. He'll tell you what, he, what he's thinking about working at, and you might find something important and that, that attracts you. No, I said, I, I, I really want to work with you if you'll have me. He said, well, if you insist, you, I'd be glad to have you work mm -hmm. with me, and so that was settled. And then, of course, he died uh, about the third year that I was in graduate school. See, that first year, I couldn't count as a year of research at Harvard. I was just taking courses there, not doing research. And at Harvard, it was a pretty, it was a real severely head held thing that you had to complete two years of laboratory work to get a doctorate degree. And after that first year at Harvard, uh, I, things were so slim financially mm -hmm. that I decided I'd be better off taking a, an assistantship, which paid $1,000 rather than $800, and give up the honor for the money. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I did that. What it meant was that I had to spend four more years there to collect the time uh, for, the, uh, for the degree. Well, as I say, I was there three years altogether, two years of research under core, and had, in those two years, had practically finished the problem. I finished the next year without, uh, without, w with essentially no uh, direction. There was a man there, I think he eventually ended up in Stanford, but he came one year to take Cole's place. And I don't know whether it was a case of uh, he knew it was temporary or whether people felt he couldn't cut the ice, but anyway, he just stayed there that one one year. Mm -hmm. And by then I was really finished with this problem. And I'd always hankered to do a physical chemistry problem. So uh, I... Uh, went around to Kistikowski, whom I'd met in, lectures, in lecture things. And I'd been very, very much attracted by his personality, as, as everyone was. He's, uh, you, don't, you don't like to make extremes, and you do, you do keep saying extreme things, but I think Kistikowski was the most personable man whom I've ever met. A man who, who, who was the most charming. Uh, uh, he, was, he was just just a delight to be around. Him. He was, uh, well, at any rate, um, he said, well, I, a problem, a job has come up here. He said, you have work done for your degree? I said, yeah, I have enough that we can publish now for a thesis. He said, well, uh, there's a job come up, but uh, it, in, it involves biochemistry. He had, uh, 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 the president, Conant, had suggested that it, uh, we might use radioactive carbon, uh, which was available then, C11, not C14, C11 was available then. As a tracer in uh, biological experiments, he thought it was time that that sort of work had been done. It, it had been used as CO2, but not through synthesis of any compound. And that uh, he thought a nice thing to do would be to make lactic acid, in which some of the, or one of the carbons was tagged by radioactivity. Uh, and then runners will be interested in this problem. Anyway, mm -hmm. what happens to lactic acid when it is formed uh, in, 
an anaerobic sort of breakdown of carbohydrate. Uh, how, what, in what order do things come apart? How, how does it, mm -hmm. how, how is it metabolized? Uh, we need somebody to make that radioactive lactic acid, and then we'll get someone from the medical school to put it in rats, and uh, and after the rats have lived long enough, we'll kill them, and um, we'll measure the. Uh, the amount of radioactivity in the glycogen that this lactic acid is supposed to go into and the amount of radioactivity in any CO2 they exhale, and, and we'll just see how that lactic acid is breaking down. What sort of a time schedule does the C11 put you on? Ah, <laughs> that, that was a mighty tight thing. Uh, this, this isotope has a half-life of only 20 minutes, and there's a limit. It has to be synthesized in a cyclotron. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what we had a cyc there was a cyclotron at Harvard. I don't know how efficient it was, or how, whether it was a big one or just a so-so one. But we could get we could get enough activity out of that so that there was still a measurable amount after. Well, five hours was the upper limit. You had to make the lactic acid and let the rat work on it and get out the glycogen in, in a half, an hour, in five hours, or no soap. Your day's work cut out for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, ev eventually, we, we figured that out. It's interesting, one of the toughest things was to purify the lactic acid once we had it. Mm -hmm. You got lactic acid there in, it's mixed in, the last step puts, gives you lactic acid in a, about a five molar solution, in a solution of about five molar HCl. So here you are, and you, you want to get the lactic acid out of that. Well, you look for something to precipitate it. There isn't any way you can precipitate lactic acid. It, it doesn't form any insoluble anything. Uh, uh, the, the only thing that I found mentioned in the literature any place was a basic tin salt of uh, uh, some sort, which I could, could, not, could not get. And uh, so eventually we had to, to go at it by physical means. Uh, we neutralized the HCl. We brought it down to a p to brought it uh, up to a pH where the HCl should be substantially neutralized. Right. Uh, but still, the lactic acid could, could could still be free lactic acid. We evaporated that down to a sort of slush. We extracted that with massive amounts of ether, but did it fast and then evaporated off the ether or evaporated to a handleable, a handleable amount and then extracted the lactic acid out of that with water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the amount of solution that we put in that poor damned rat, if it, had been, if it had been a human, would be about the same as if you took a syringe that held a liter <laughs> of liquid and had that squirted into your abdomen. Well, now, right. this, is, this is one of the very first biological experiments done with a radio tracer. It's the first experiment done in which radioactive, radioactive acid, lactic acid was turned into, a compound is synthesized and used mm -hmm. in a biological tracer. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it was not yeah, in our days, it's project. C14 and plenty. They don't realize how much different it was than the C11. No, but what I like is that they still use the synthesis that I devised now that they got C14. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's still the best way to make lactic acid. Is that right? Yeah. yeah in, the, in the books that describe now how to make radioactive carbon, mm -hmm. they still do it this way. That's, that's nice. So, you, I don't know. 
I left I left Harvard with the expectation. Well, Kistiakowski, he was tied up with war business, but he wanted to see this work go on, and so he dug up enough funds to pay me uh, a salary to continue doing this sort of work at Harvard. Mm -hmm. But I'd got married in the meantime. And my wife and I were both anxious to start a family and start living, you know, like people do, not like students do. Well, he assured me that he'd get me enough money to live on that and that I would probably not get any more than any other job I was likely to get. I went out to Williams and not interviewed for a job at Williams College, which is one of those sort of snotty New England colleges. And they, they offered me a job that would have paid me more than it would starting at DuPont. But no research. You're here to teach students. You're not, not any research here. And then finally I got offered a job at Carnegie Tech to teach there. And I decided that it would be a better idea for me to cut my apron strings with with that with with Harvard and and uh, go for the independence of an mm -hmm. academic life of Carnegie Tech. And about halfway through the year I spent at Carnegie Tech, I found I didn't by that time I found I didn't like teaching at all. I liked teaching I had two classes, a course in organic in uh, physical organic chemistry. It was the first the course was taught at Carnegie Tech. And it was taught in the evening. So Carnegie Tech then had a big program for uh, students who were not in the college. They, they right. were they students. These, these con consisted of lectures once, one night a week, uh, two, two plus hours each night. And I didn't know enough chemistry to be teaching that course. Mm -hmm. I, it, took, it took all the time that I could possibly spare to study to keep ahead of the class, mm -hmm. using Hammett's book as the, your, as the your Bible. Bible. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. the, I also had a course in general chemistry, a quiz course, they call them then. And that went all right. I had mm -hmm. no trouble with that. But, about the middle of the year, uh, the head of the department come around and he said, we uh, are so pleased with your teaching that we want to make you an assistant professor and uh, let you take over the chemistry here this summer. Oh my God, I don't <laughs> want to do this. So I'd been offered a job with DuPont, and I wrote to, to Sandberg and asked him if the job was still open. Mm -hmm. And this read, led to a difficult evening uh, because before, before making the offer again, he wrote to Carnegie Tech, mm -hmm. unbeknownst to me. I didn't know what etiquette was in these matters. He wrote to Carnegie Tech and says, uh, Dr. Kramer's written asking for employment here. And uh, how about it? How's Carnegie Tech going to feel about that? Uh -huh. Just about the time that, that Warner, who was head of the department, got that letter, he was in, we were having a dinner party with him and his wife. It's just before this. And uh, you probably know my affection for Fats Waller. Yes. And at that time, I was exposing lots of people with Fats Waller, and I gave it to him, and he, a little bit of that, and he was so damned enthusiastic that I played Fats Waller records for a good bit of the evening, not knowing all the time that he had this letter from Tanberg and, uh -huh. and what my plans were. But, but he finally, but, but he did. Uh, tell Tamberg it would be all right. Mm -hmm. And then just a 
couple of weeks after that, George Kistikowski came by. Happened I had a cold, and he, he looked me up at first at Carnegie, and he came out to the apartment. I, it was a bad cold, and I stayed home. Gwen was filling me with a dozen oranges every day. And uh, he said, what are you? Here I come to see you in the laboratory, and what are you doing? You're loafing. I said, uh, no, I haven't. I got a cold. He said, how's teaching going? And I said, not so good. I think I'm going to take a job with DuPont next year. That sh he, he turned sad over that, and he said, uh, well, I was going to offer you something, but uh, if you're going with DuPont, that's uh, enough. Well, he, was, he had come out to uh, the uh, explosive lab at uh, north of Pittsburgh. You know, Brewston. Yeah, Brewston, mm -hmm. to work on explosives for the government. And I'm pretty sure he was offering me a job up there. But I came on to DuPont, and that's how I kept, that's how I got to DuPont finally. Very good. So, how did you get to Michigan? Well, you were born in Pennsylvania and went to college there. I was born in Michigan, went to the University of Michigan. That, that seems entirely reasonable. Well. And I've got my PhD. That's Lake Forest, huh? I, I went to Lake Forest College, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And I was lined up to get my PhD about the time the, we entered the war. Oh, uh, yeah. And the draft pressure was on, and uh, they had what I learned later it was an explosives program at Michigan, the uh, research. And uh, I, through a friend, I was able to get a connection there where I'd uh, take this. Uh, research job for the government, which uh, well, now, looked, looked very attractive to me at that time. Employment at DuPont protected me from the draft. Mm -hmm. So I stayed on the University of Michigan during the war years and came out here in 45. Mm -hmm. I remember the, the group of chemists that came in at, at 45, they were entirely different from the at about that time, yes. I, back then, they were the, the new group. They're entirely different from those of us who had come into the department before the war. I think brasher, more independent fellows than we were. Well, I think we were more. Uh, we considered getting a job. Uh, a lot more good fortune, you know, to get a job than you guys did. You, you're not surprised that you got a job. You know, in '45, the job market for yeah. chemists was quite good. Uh, to get, to get a job with, with Dupont was really something. Now, Arthur, Arthur Tanberg uh, interviewed interviewed me. Came came up to Harvard. And it's the only person I saw from Dupont. Well, it's the same case with me. He came to Michigan, interviewed me, and. Uh, this was early in the war. They didn't give interview trips at that time, so that I was offered a position with DuPont without coming out for an on-site interview. Well, that's something that that uh, we did get. We earlier people did get. We got it. I got a trip down to Wilmington. Mm -hmm. I come down, and I looked at the experimental station. And this was bef before I had acted on Kistiakowski's offer to get money for me to stay at Harvard, or mm -hmm. before I'd acted on the, I guess before I'd heard about the uh, Carnegie Tech thing. I came down, Herman Schroeder was here. I'd, uh, we had uh, had a room together one summer while I was at Harvard. I knew him quite well. And uh, he, he showed me around some. Now, had he been a Kohler student? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, he, he worked under core. Well, I, my God, this place is too big. I'll, I'll get lost in here. They're never, it just, it's just like crawling into a crowd. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I went back home, back up to Cambridge, and 
I thought, well, I guess I'm not, I'm not ready to break away. I think I'll take Kisty's offer. I still hadn't, I had made up, I still hadn't told Tanberg what my position was. Mm -hmm. And then the, the offer came from Carnegie Tech. And I turned down Kisty's offer. I turned down uh, the uh, uh, offer of DuPont. I said that, uh, no, I turned down the offer of DuPont before I turned down Kisty because I told him that Kisty had got the money mm -hmm. and that I was going to stay at Harvard to complete the work that uh, I had to continue with the work I had done there. And he wrote back and said that would be fine and uh, they would consider that year of work as more experience and that uh, take that in consideration for the salary offered to me next year if I wanted to come down with DuPont or later. It's sort of an open-ended mm -hmm. Very nice for you. Yeah. And then the offer came through from Carnegie Tech and and I turned down Kissy's offer. And, and so that's how finally I came, mm -hmm. came to DuPont. Well, I'd had a number of interesting problems in DuPont over 20 years of research. In 1955, when I was looking around for a new problem to work on, uh, I came across the proposal by Glenn Hager that uh, study be made of uh, homogeneous catalysis and uh, particularly of transition metals and things of this sort, just no, catalysis so and that's homogeneous how that, systems. That's how so, there's the origin of that. So I Did Tom Alderson there. come in at the same time? He came in uh, about a year and a half later. Mm -hmm. So we worked worked along uh, looking at a much, very much a scouting program. We had a half From a dozen. what basis did you start, platinum? Uh, I did some work with the noble metals early on, but I did, did quite a lot with the uh, cobalt, iron, nickel metals, oh. and did a lot of just uh, unusual compounds containing uh, transition elements that were available from the, our department research over the last uh, five or 10 years. And mm -hmm. we had a few scouting candidate reactions, and we'd just empirically you know, take a attractive reaction and uh, take a number of these catalyst candidates. Mm -hmm. And nothing really was at all interesting uh, from the standpoint of giving good catalysis that we found the combination of platinum chloride and stannous chloride. Mm -hmm. And this, this we picked up from a, a journal article from Ayers, who was an analytical chemist at the University of Texas. And he was mm -hmm. using this combination. He made complexes that contained both platinum. That's right. This you is an analytical method for platinum, a color, color metric method. You know, um, what, what tin chloride will do, you, you, you're familiar with the uh, Zeissi salt, which is the classical yes. mm -hmm. compound that has ethylene mm -hmm. attached to platinum. Right. It's, it's the, th the compound that just sort of the grandfather that, that people used to study for mm -hmm. a compound of ethylene, of ethylene with, a, with a metal. Um, and the way that's usually made is, uh, is to treat platinum with ethylene, platinum chloride, uh, I guess chloroplatinic acid, mm -hmm. four valent platinum, just sort of the grandfather that that people used to study for mm -hmm. a compound of ethylene, of ethylene with, a, with a metal. Um, and the way that's usually made is, uh, is to treat platinum with ethylene, platinum chloride, uh, I guess chloroplatinic acid, mm -hmm. four valent platinum that's right. mm -hmm. with ethylene, and you let it stand around a while, and after a while, this ethylene yes. complex comes out. Um, one of, the, one of the things that I found in the course of fooling around with other metals and rhodium was that if you put in a pinch of sodium, of stannous chloride, that reaction goes like a bang. Is that Zeiss right? salt comes pounding right out without any, without any weight. Well, I, 
the stannous chloride surely has a big effect on the, the platinum and that yeah. it shows up in the catalysis. It's very much different than platinum. Well, it, may, it may well be that this, it facilitates the, the coordination of mm -hmm. organic species. Or, may, or maybe it's just the, it's not the simple reduction because there, there, there are lots of screwy things in this. I look at the acetyl acetate complex. And, of course, that dissolves. Uh, that the, that's not the one I want you to look at. I want you to look at the diethylene rhodium chloride dimer. Yes. That dissolves right away in, in ethanolic HCl. Mm -hmm. In sulfuric acid, not a thing happens. And the chloride's very different for yeah. anions. But for... For a real difference, you take the acetyl acetonate complex, and you'd think almost any acid would peel off the acetyl acetonate group. It doesn't. HCl pulls it off, but sulfuric acid doesn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It'll stand for. It'll stand for about a day, for 24 hours, and then by then the, the acetyl acetonate would be off. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, if you try to run your high pressure dimerization of ethylene with the acetyl acetonate, keep the chloride out, that you can do mm -hmm. with the acetyl acetonate, mm -hmm. and run it with sulfuric acid, and run it at 600 pounds, uh, 600 atmospheres of ethylene, mm -hmm. and heat it to 120 degrees the, after the normal pressure tube run, sit five, six hours, something like that maybe overnight for some of them. You get a smidgen of mm -hmm. one butene, mm -hmm. nothing more. And it's, there, there is a real mystery to be solved in, in the effect of that HCl. I didn't, ha you know, I forgot to mention that in today. Mm -hmm. That's a shame. Because it's, the, the halide is as much is as important to the catalyst as the rhodium is. You only get dimerization with hydrogen iodide, which is best, hydrogen bromide, which is not quite so good, or hydrogen chloride, which is. And it appears to be that you need the whole H, the whole H halogen molecule. Mm -hmm. Ionizing solvents just shut it off. Mm -hmm. You do it in chloroform, and the reactions go at minus 60, minus 70 degrees. You do it in alcohol. The more dilute the alcohol, the slower. But in the sort of reactions that we usually use, mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, minus 35 degrees for a lower limit for, uh, for the reaction. You go lower than that, it just doesn't occur. Mm -hmm. If you go to you can tell the difference in dilution of water. Um, it's, a, it's a problem that really should be looked at. And again, this was part of what Chad Tolman was mm -hmm. expected to do. Mm -hmm. Well, how does, what, how can you get some clue to the formation of hyd metal hydrides in these reactions? It was in the original publication, but I guess no one's ever reported, at least I've never seen any clue. Mm -hmm.